And obviously, the temperature will drop when the downpours come along and we'll keep those heavy showers over Wales, the Midlands, and perhaps pushing into northern England through this evening. So a continued risk of heavy slow moving downpours that could cause some disruption, certainly a lot of spray and surface water on the roads. Many western and southern parts will become dry overnight, temperatures dipping down to 10 Celsius along the south coast. Uh, elsewhere, we're looking at 12 to 13 to start Friday. We're going to start with further cloud and rain across northeast Scotland, just like this morning. And then, uh, just like today, we're going to watch the showers breaking out. Probably not as intense and there's a bit more movement to them, so they'll be moving through a bit more readily during Friday. And Wales, South West England looking a lot drier tomorrow. But notice cloud and rain splitting into Northern Ireland. That is the next weather system that's going to bring some heavy rain and gusty winds likely during Friday evening. That'll steadily spread across the country on Friday night and into the weekend. Elsewhere, things getting a little drier, certainly to start with uh, over the weekend. But that weather front will bring some rain edging in from the west during Saturday. And then a ridge of high pressure should bring some drier weather as we go into next week. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a Brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. We are GB News. We are right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. It's 12 o'clock, I'm Gloria DiPiero, and this is The Briefing. We've got a great Life and Times interview with Michael Portello later on in the programme. Analysis from Kevin Maguire and Andrew Pierce too. And remember Tom Watson, he was literally a political giant, will be speaking to the former deputy of the Labour Party too. All that after your news with Rihanna. Thank you, Gloria. It's coming up to one minute past 12. Your top stories from the GB newsroom. President Zelensky says he's grateful to the UK for allocating an extra £1 billion of military aid for Ukraine's fight against Russia. The 77% hike in funding will go towards boosting the country's capabilities, including its air defence systems. It takes the UK's total military and economic support for Kyiv to £3.8 billion this year. Boris Johnson says the British weapons, equipment and training are transforming Ukraine's defences. 
Meanwhile, Labour says government cuts to troop numbers here in the UK are putting our NATO obligations at risk. 10,000 service personnel will be cut from the British Army over the next three years as the group summit in Spain draws to a close today. Shadow Defence Secretary John Healy told GB News the UK's standing in the world is under threat. This is embarrassing for Britain. It's not responding to the growing threats we face. And, 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 and it is calling into question our ability as Britain to play a leading role in NATO and fulfil our obligations. Well, Tory former Defence Minister Tobias Elwood says he believes MPs would vote to reverse government plans to cut troops and that the nation would support them. It's clearly not the time to be cutting our army by 10,000 troops because this sends a clear message to Putin that we're not in it for the long haul. We can't sustain two battle groups in Estonia and place pressure on the army to conduct all its other duties to keep the nation safe. Mr Speaker, can we have a debate and indeed a vote on reversing these cuts? If there was a free vote, I sure I know how the House would act and they would have the nation's support. The European Court of Human Rights is urging Russia to stop the death penalties given to two British men from being carried out. Aidan Aslan and Sean Pinner were handed death sentences in Donetsk for fighting Russian forces in Ukraine. Both men live in the country and the UK government insists they should be treated as prisoners of war. Passengers say Heathrow is total chaos this morning after the airport, or this afternoon, I should say, after the airport ordered the cancellation of 30 flights. Heathrow bosses say they're working with airlines to get those affected rebooked on alternative flights. Well, our reporter Rosie Wright joins us now from Heathrow. Rosie, what's it like there and what more can you tell us? Good afternoon to you, Rhiannon. And it really has been a morning of disruption at Heathrow Airport. 30 flights that had been scheduled to take off had been cancelled. Heathrow Airport spoke to the airlines directly and said, we simply don't have the capacity to serve the number of passengers that are scheduled to take off. So 30 of those flights have got to go. British Airways, the largest flight carrier operating out of this airport, have been the most affected. They've said that they've contacted all of those passengers, apologised to them, and are trying to find them alternative routes. It is another blip in consumer confidence, having had a few weeks now of long delays at security, not having enough baggage handlers, for people saying, well, looking ahead to my summer holidays, we've got British Airways strikes coming up soon. How much confidence can I have that the flight I paid for, that I turned up to the airport for, how much confidence can I have that it's actually going to take off? Another blip is one way of putting it. Rosie, thank you very much. Rosie Wright, our reporter from Heathrow Airport there. More than half of Scottish people don't want another independence referendum. That's according to a new poll. Research by the Scotsman newspaper says 53% think there shouldn't be an Indy Ref 2. 40% say there should be, with the remainder undecided. It's after First Minister Nicola Sturgeon announced plans to push for a second vote in October next year. Meanwhile, a former Scottish MP has been jailed for two years for embezzling nearly £25,000. Ex-SNP member Natalie McGarry stole the money from two pro-independence groups. The former representative for Glasgow East was convicted last month on two charges of embezzlement. A judge said the 40-year-old had betrayed those who'd put their trust in her. An inquiry has been launched into the charity set up in honour of Army veteran and fundraiser Captain Sir Tom Moore. The charity commission is concerned about the management of the Captain Tom Foundation and its independence from the late veteran's family. Sir Tom died last year aged 100. He'd raised millions for the NHS. That money isn't part of the inquiry. The foundation said it would work closely with the commission. This is GB News. We'll have more as it happens now, though. It's back to the briefing with Gloria De Piero. Welcome. Coming up this hour, the Prime Minister will be speaking at NATO shortly. We'll bring you that live when he does. The Mail's Andrew Pearce and The Mirror's Kevin Maguire will be with me for a review of the week. I'll ask former Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, Tom Watson, if the party are on the path back to power. And he'll tell me how we lost so much weight. My latest Life and Times interview is with Michael Portillo. He says the Tories shouldn't get rid of Boris Johnson when they haven't a clue who they'd put in his place. And as always, we'd love to hear from you. 
Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. The Prime Minister is expected to give a news conference within the hour as the NATO summit in Madrid closes. Overnight, the government announced an additional billion pounds in military support for Ukraine, taking the total sum offered by Britain to fight Russia's invading forces to around 2.3 billion. Our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, has been reporting on the NATO summit from Madrid and sent us this update. Well, it's the final day of the NATO summit here in Madrid. We're expected to hear from the Prime Minister a little bit later on probably trying to spell out the details of that announcement that was made overnight about an extra thousand troops that are going to be deployed to NATO's eastern flank and an extra one billion pounds as well in addition to uh, actually frankly more than two billion pounds that's already been contributed to uh, the efforts in the war in Ukraine in recent uh, months. It's clearly quite a sizable uh, contribution. The UK, along with NATO allies, Germany, the United States and others, insisting that they do have Ukraine's back in this war. I think, as Emmanuel Macron, the French president, put it quite recently, that this is a war that Ukraine needs to win. Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO secretary general, suggesting that there was a iron, a clad iron guarantee that they would have NATO's backing, whatever the costs. And that is why we're seeing these announcements in the recent days about extra supplies of weapons, communication systems and fuel to try and help out the Ukrainians. Frankly, though, the Ukrainians, as always, perhaps unsurprisingly, want to see NATO go uh, further. But in the end, it is also a reminder in many regards about the restraints and the constraints on Britain's contribution. And the reason I say that is because many people feel that actually given the cuts we've seen to the Defence Forces in recent years, and I say many people, I include the Chief of the General Staff in all of this, that they think it is not necessarily terribly sustainable to carry on cutting the Defence Forces, particularly the Army, in the years to come while trying to up our contribution to NATO. So what we've seen this week is a real big debate actually within government in which the Ministry of Defence the Foreign Office have essentially been campaigning for an increase in defence spending at a time of a cost of living crisis. And Downing Street and the Treasury not necessarily been wholly on board with all of this. And it is a really, really crucial debate about whether Britain can afford, frankly, at this time in which there's you know, calls for tax cuts in which the cost of living is going up, whether we can contribute more to NATO, whether we can increase defence spending. Uh, and I expect it is going to be a debate that rages within government in the weeks and months to come, as those calls for greater defence spending only grow. Our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, sent us that report from the NATO summit. We're going to dip into that NATO summit Just in there. Madrid, where NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg is holding a news conference. From the Russian government. He said that if there were NATO weapon systems placed in those two countries, that that would precipitate a direct response from his government. And could I also ask you to respond directly to him and when he says that at this point, Ukraine should surrender completely and all he wants is the Donbass region. Also, we decide today uh, to support Ukraine, to make sure that Ukraine uh, prevails as an independent sovereign state in Europe. And uh, President Putin's uh, brutal war uh, uh, against Ukraine is absolutely unacceptable. It's uh, causing a lot of uh, death damage uh, um, for the Ukrainian people, but uh, it also has uh, ramifications uh, uh, over the whole world, not, the, not least because of the increase in food prices. So it's uh, President Putin that should uh, withdraw its forces and end this war immediately by stopping attacking a democratic sovereign nation and causing so much suffering in Ukraine. When it comes to Finland and Sweden, Finland and Sweden are sovereign nations and they have the right to choose their own path and to join NATO. We have welcomed them into our alliance and we are of course prepared for any eventuality um, but at the same time, I think what we see now in Ukraine... Um... And that was the NATO Secretary General there as the NATO conference comes to an end. The Prime Minister expected to speak later and, of course, we'll bring you that live on GB News. But now, Keir Starmer was delighted to win back Wakefield from the Conservatives in last Friday's by-election. But what are Labour's prospects in a general election? Are they finally back on a path to power? And is a London former lawyer the right person to lead them? To discuss this, I'm delighted to be joined by Labour's former deputy leader, Tom Watson. Tom, good to see you. Good to see you, Gloria. 
Many voters have no clear idea who Sir Keir Starmer is and the Labour leader must define himself before it's too late. Uh, not my words, the words of Lord Peter Mandelson. How is he going to do that? Well, I think Labour... Uh, firstly, I don't believe all these criticisms. I think it's nonsense. I think two years in, from the worst defeat Labour has had in 75 years, it is almost a miracle that Labour are doing so well in the polls where Keir Starmer's leadership ratings are so good and where our economic cred credibility is so good and more importantly where he is unifying his shadow cabinet which we've not had the benefit of for five years so all credit to him uh, and all those people jumping on his back should jump off again. My personal view is that the next conference is key. Labour's got to define its approach to the political economy. Just like the government are struggling to try and work out how you deal with post-COVID, how you deal with war in Europe, how you deal with an energy crisis, how you deal with double-digit inflation, Labour's got to do the same. And it's harder in opposition because they don't have the resources uh, and they don't have the information. Uh, but I know they know what the problem is, or what the challenge is, and I've absolutely no doubt that Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves will rise to it. But the challenges that Labour now faces are with working class voters, with the voters in the heartlands, the voters who stayed with them through thick and thin until 2019. Does a North London lawyer, Keir Starmer, have what it takes to reconnect? I think he does. I, I think there's a premium on integrity, decency, strong values. He, he possesses those in in uh, in space. It, I mean, it's a shame that you need to restate the case for that because it should be obvious that those are what you that those are values that people in public office should adhere to. But circumstances have meant that people are looking at that. And certainly on the basis of my one visit back to my old constituency, uh, which, like yours, Gloria, is what you'd call a red wall seat. I met a lot of 2019 first-time Conservative voters who were very, very angry with Boris Johnson. They felt really let down. Some felt betrayed. Um, they were still looking to Labour, uh, looking at what Labour stood for. I think Keir had sort of passed the test with them, but they wanted to know that the team around him were strong as well. I think the sitting behind that was they didn't want a hard left manifesto like Jeremy Corbyn offered them in 2019. Now, those of us that are involved in day-to-day -day politics know there's absolutely no chance of that happening, but Labour's got to get that message over in those red wall seats if it's going to bring those people back in sufficient numbers to be at the races in the next general election. And let's not forget, nobody Nobody would predict that Labour would have any chance at the next election of forming a government two years ago. They now do have a chance, but it's still amounting to climb electorally. And the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, he's having a big conference today. We hear from him quite regularly. Um, when he was first elected, he was loved by a majority. By the time he'd left office, he was loathed by many. He certainly has a complex legacy for the Labour Party. Are there lessons that uh, we can learn from the former Prime Minister or is he, does he belong in history? No, I think he has a great contribution to that. He was actually very personally supportive of me when I was deputy leader, uh, which given that I resigned under his government in 2006, I thought was very gracious and very big of him and I appreciated it. The thing is about these experienced prime ministers, they've been there. You know, they shouldn't be removed from public life. I'd like to see more from Gordon Brown and John Major as well. They can contribute to future public policy. This country is in a crisis. It's in an economic crisis. You could argue we've got a social crisis with disparities in wealth and power. And we've certainly got a political crisis internationally. Ex-prime ministers have a lot to say and can and can help shape the discussion. So I'm very pleased he's done his event today. I'm glad it's cross-party. Cross you don't have to be as partisan when you leave sort of frontline politics. And I hope he can help the prime minister and Keith Starmer with their thinking in the months ahead. Now, Tom, um, a more personal uh, question for you now. I have a copy of this book. And um, I hope this is not too rude, but you were, in a very literal sense a political giant. I mean, you were, you were a very big bloke. You've lost half your body weight. How does that feel? Not far off half my body weight. Um, well, if I'm croaky, it's just because I've been out a, a, for a run before you uh, interviewed me uh, there, Gloria. But I do feel good. And, and actually, this book, Lose Weight for Life, is 
on the back of another book I wrote about how I, you know, why I decided to lose the weight and how I put it on over 30 years. And I had so many emails and letters and social media questions that my publisher said, look, can you, can you do another book where you just sort of do a blueprint to say how you Oh, I think we may have just lost. Oh, are you, you're there, you're there. Just uh, but before we let you go, very quick top tips on losing weight, but more importantly, keeping it off. Yeah, maintenance is key. You need a, you, you, there's mindset and maintenance there. I'm now five years diabetes free because I've managed wow. to keep the weight off. But the, the key thing is you always fail when you're on a lifestyle change, but don't punish yourself when you have bad days and be kind to yourself when you have good days. And if you could start with that approach and get a good maintenance program, you're going to be able to keep it off the life. And that's what my new book's about. Thanks very much. Good to see you, former Deputy Leader of the Labour Party. And um, Finn, Tom Watson, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Prime Minister has been out of the country for eight days in Rwanda, Germany and finally Spain. But he won't have a soft landing when he gets home. The cost of living crisis is getting worse and Conservative MPs are still plotting to get rid of him. Joining me now to discuss all of this, to review the week, is Kevin Maguire, Associate Editor for The Daily Mirror and Andrew Pearce, Consultant Editor at The Daily Mail. Uh, good to see you, uh, gentlemen. We like to bring a bit of wit brains and perhaps some beauty too from you too. Um, let us start with the economy. Uh, serious question. Um, Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, says Britain is suffering a sharper economic slowdown than other rich countries and inflation looks set to last longer here than elsewhere. Um, Andrew, why? Well, I don't think the government has helped, frankly, uh, putting out uh, national insurance rates. No other country in Europe is putting up taxes. They're also going to put up corporation taxes. Uh, we've got sky up. We've got problems with our fuel bills, partly because of all the green taxes written into the fuel bills. So the government is not helping itself at all, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, I don't look at the Labour Party to see they've got any solution. But um, a Tory government should not be raising taxes in, as we're heading into a, a recession, which could be the worst for 40 years. So, Kevin, Andrew says, well, the government's partly to blame. I'm sure you agree with him, but is it the same criticism as Andrew makes, Kevin? Yeah, you said you wanted with brains and beauty. I was wondering what Andrew was doing on your programme. Uh, he was here as an imposter. But, uh, I mean, he, he's, actually, he's actually right in his criticism uh, of, the, of the government. The challenge for, for Labour is to come up with new answers. Of course, they did have a windfall tax on energy bills, which the, the government has now borrowed and adapted. But we have long-term problems in the UK economy. We've had low productivity, low investment for decades. And then you chuck in the chaos of Brexit, which has just broken trading links and created bureaucracy and, and hit our trade. It's going to get worse. I think it's really, really significant when the governor of the Bank of England, appointed by this government, says that we're going to be uh, one, of the, one of the worst coming through this. We've got the highest of the, the major economies uh, inflation. We took the biggest hit during COVID. Yeah, we bounced back, but we're still uh, we're struggling. There's been no economic miracle over the, uh, the last 12 years. Uh, in fact, since the uh, 2008 financial crash, all but 12 of those 14 years the Conservatives have been in power, we've struggled. Uh, successive Prime Ministers, David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, talk about some UK economic merit. Well, there is none, as people know, in their wage packets and they see what's happening in public services. It's funny, it's funny that Kevin never wants to mention, does he, the extraordinary success on employment. We've got the lowest unemployment now for 50 years, more people in jobs than ever before, and that is down to 12 years of Tory rule. You'd have thought a Labour supporter like Kevin would have welcomed that, but of course he can't bring Andrew, himself to give the Tories credit for Andrew, you, anything ever. You, you are clueless, Andrew, about the insecurity and low pay suffered by so many people who are well, in it's work. Than being so, yeah, unemployment is low, but a lot of people are in terrible jobs as a result. And also, you probably missed out that now 21% of the population has given up on work uh, altogether. People are retiring early to spend their pension pots. There's going to be problems down, uh, down the line. So, yeah, right. unemployment is low, but why, it, why is it low? There's a lot of bad jobs in the economy that mean people can't afford to live on the money they earn, and a lot of people have just opted out altogether since COVID. 
Andrew, let's talk about the Prime Minister. I've got a great Michael Bartello interview that we may or may not be playing today, depending on when the Prime Minister appears at his press conference from NATO. He says something interesting to me. He said, those that have never done anything other than hold a safe seat should not be challenging someone who won the London mayoralty twice, won the Brexit referendum and won an 80-seat majority. The trouble is, will Tory MPs back off, Andrew? Well, that's a very interesting point by Michael Portillo, who is not a natural Boris supporter, let me say. Uh, and, uh, and he does have a point. But Boris Johnson has what, secured a majority of 80 two and a half years ago, the best Tory majority since 1987. Uh, I don't think this is the time to get rid of him. But I think the, the, mo the most important moment of danger for Boris, and I've always thought this, is the committee which is going to look into whether he misled Parliament over party gate. Did he lie when he said there were no parties? It's being chaired by Harriet Harman, which is odd, because she's already said that's the Labour MP, that he did lie over it. And if that committee, which even though it has a Tory majority, says he misled Parliament, he could be suspended, which will be yet another first for our glorious Prime Minister. And I think that would be the end of the road. So in a sense, it's not. it might not even be up to Tory MPs. It might be up to that small privileges committee, which starts it, started its work this week. Well, will we get to the report of that committee, Kevin? Because uh, there could be an autumn general election. He could call a snap general election, some t something he repeatedly refuses to definitively rule out. Um, what, what are yeah. the chances of that, in your view, Kevin? Yeah, Gloria, you're right. Now he's got shot of the Fixed Term Parliament Act. He can just decide one day he wants to jump in the uh, chauffeur-driven car and go to the palace or Windsor Castle and tell the Queen he, he wants uh, an, an election now, and he can he can get that. It's not not position I think we should tolerate in British politics. Uh, but never, nevertheless, it's been set out this scenario uh, to me by more than one Tory MP because they say. In July, the energy rebates will be felt. People will get the money for that. In July, the rate at which you pay national insurance will go up the threshold to 12,500. And, of course, he wants to escape the Privileges Committee, which it does have seven, uh, seven members for them, Conservatives. And it shows you the paranoia in Downing Street that he thinks he's going to be stitched up by a committee with a Tory majority. Essentially, what number 10 are saying is, uh, find him uh, innocent, or we're going to claim it wasn't a fair, fair hearing. I mean, it's an appalling political situation. Now, I would have thought, yeah, it does have that chance, if you like, or that option of calling a general election. But after Wakefield and after Tiverton and Honiton, wouldn't you be the kamikaze prime minister if you did that? Maybe if Keir Starmer is forced out and Angela Rayner, his deputy, have to resign because the Durham Constabulary find they broke COVID rules and fine them, maybe then I could see he'd go. And yeah, it would be the ultimate uh, political opportunism but he wouldn't be the first and probably not going to be the last uh, prime minister to do that. I think it's unlikely, but it's a possibility. And he also wants to try and keep his own side uh, behind him by saying, look, we may have a snap general election. And that focuses the minds of MPs because what they're concerned about most are their own seats. But OK, I promised. It, oh, I sorry. Cut off his nose to spite his face. I promised our viewers wit too. So we're going to end on a question. We've only got about a minute or so left. Michael Gove was seen in one last year. Matt Hancock was seen in one last week. Should politicians ever be seen in nightclubs, Andrew? Uh, not if they dance like Kevin Maguire, because he's the worst <laughs> dancer in the whole of Westminster, if not the whole of Western Europe. He's, he's politics are left wing and he's got three left feet. So definitely not. <laughs> I'm Kevin, fine, though, because I can night, start the night fantastic. that relied on Andrew Pearce to buy a drink would go bust. <laughs> I've never seen anybody uh, discover he's left something behind so fast when you get near the bar. He likes a drink, I'll give him that, but he likes other people to, to buy it. Now, I, I actually think more, more MPs, more ministers in nightclubs, the, the, the better. It'll, it'll show they're human. M Michael Go, the best thing that ever happened to him was seeing those pictures of him dancing because it made him appear human. All sure he is. I think there's a bit of a cyborg about go. Oh, we're enjoying you so much that we just want to have another question with you. Um, uh, the, the producers just instructed me to keep you. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, MPs, uh, the uh, com a committee, a uh, parliamentary committee today, uh, they should not bring babies into the Commons. That's what that report has said today. Is that sensible or is it backward? As far as I'm aware, it's allowed in the European Parliament. Why not ours? 
Andrew? I, well, look, there's, there's a crash already, but it has to be said in Parliament, there's more bar facilities in Parliament than there are crash facilities, and there are thousands of people who work in the building. Look, I, I think if, it, if a, a mother, it's normally going to be a mother has no other choice but take the baby to the chamber, it's not the end of the world. A crying baby often makes a lot more sense than the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, let me tell you. And it sounds better too, because he's got a terrible voice. Kevin, is it a bit backward <laughs> Gloria, to not just, allow... Yeah, just get the doorkeepers to wear Andrew Pearce masks and there'd be no <laughs> mother or father who'd want to take their parent into that chamber. They'd just recover. They could also go, you know, use them on fireplaces, those Andrew, Andrew uh, uh, Pearce masks. Um, now, I, I think Stella Christie's a fantastic uh, MP, a superb uh, campaigner, but I think she's wrong here. I'm not sure she's doing other mothers in particular a favour, otherwise you might get other uh, employers. You say, well, I can't come to work because I've uh, got a childcare crisis. And say, right, uh, bring your, your kid to work. There's, there's lots of people can't take their kids to work. You couldn't uh, have them in the cab of a bus or in a taxi or in a construction site. So now I think yeah, babies should be welcome around Parliament, but not in the chamber itself. Can't wait to speak to you again next week. You're brilliant fun and you definitely do bring brains with your wit. I'm, I'm not, still not sure about the beauty, but thank you, Bill. Thank you, Kevin nice Maguire and Andrew you. Pierce. All right. Nice to see you. Cheers. Cheers. Um, now, the cost of the royal family has risen to a record £100 million, according to the monarchy's annual financial statement. The revelations come after the Queen met Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, yesterday in the wake of her unveiling plans for a second referendum. So with costs rising and independence potentially on the horizon, what will happen to the monarchy in Scotland if it votes to leave? Cameron Walker has been finding out. What I will never do is allow Scottish democracy to be a prisoner of Boris Johnson or any yes. Prime Minister. Strong words from the First Minister, who believes she has a mandate to cut ties with Westminster and carve out a new independent Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon's statement comes the week the Queen and the royal family are celebrating the country's culture and heritage at Holyrood. She met Her Majesty for a one-on-one -on -one meeting yesterday. What was discussed remains private. But what would happen to the Queen if Scotland becomes independent? Professor Robert Hazel is a constitutional expert and predicts Scotland will become the 15th Commonwealth realm where Her Majesty is head of state. The Queen would be represented by a Governor General as she is in the other countries where she is also head of state around the world. And it would be for the Scottish Government, in effect, to choose that Governor General. That's what happens in places like Australia and New Zealand. There were once separate monarchies in England and Scotland. Following the death of Elizabeth I in 1603, the Union of the Crowns bound the monarchies together. It was a hundred years later that the two parliaments merged and MPs representing Scotland sat in Westminster for the first time. Royal historian David Starkey explains. The union that is wanted to be dissolved by, by Nicola Sturgeon is this second union. It's the union of 1707. And this is the thing that powers everything. This is why it's so important. It transforms Scotland. Scotland, before that point, is backward. It's desperately poor. We could build a new Scotland. The Scottish Government says a new independent Happy. Scotland could be wealthier, happier and fairer. and fairer. It would also keep the Queen as head of state and it would be up to the people of Scotland to decide if they want to change that. Cameron Walker, GB News. In a moment, we'll be bringing you Boris Johnson live from NATO. First, here's the news. No, we're going to cut straight to the Prime Minister. in the unity and single-mindedness with which this alliance is confronting Putin's illegal and barbaric invasion of Ukraine. After 127 days of war, we in NATO are now more resolved than ever that Europe's boundaries can't be changed by force and that we must give the Ukrainians the means to protect themselves. And we are, in the last few days, Virtually everyone around the table has agreed to give more to help. And at the same time, we have to recognise that the impacts of this brutal invasion of Ukraine uh, are being felt around the world. In Africa, in Latin America, 
in Asia. There's, there's not a country that is not now being affected by the surge in energy prices, the shortages of food and fertilizer. And so just as we in the UK are focused on helping people with the cost of living, £1,200 going uh, to next month in July uh, to the 8 million most vulnerable households uh, with more help to come, £400 for every family to help with the costs of energy. So too the governments of the, of the Commonwealth, of the G7 and of NATO are determined to work together to ease... Can you hear me? No. You're right? No. I'll just say to shout. Can you pick it up roughly? Yeah? I'm, I'm just going to have to... I'm just going to have to project my voice. So too the governments of, of the Commonwealth, G7 and NATO are determined to work together to ease the pressure around the world, whether that means getting the grain out of Ukraine or encouraging moves to increase global energy supplies or helping our countries to find alternative supplies of fertilizer. And we must frankly recognize the risk that not every country takes the same view of Putin's invasion or sees it in the way that we do. So we've agreed together uh, to work to explode some myths. We have to explode the myth that Western sanctions are in some way responsible for these price spikes, when of course it is the, the Russian uh, invasion uh, that has caused the uh, shortages of food and, uh, and it is Putin's bl blockades uh, that are stopping uh, the, the grain leaving uh, Ukrainian ports. And we need to, uh, to explode the myth that it was in any way uh, NATO that had responsibility uh, for provoking the conflict. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you want proof that NATO is a purely defensive alliance, you could have no more eloquent testimony than the accession of Finland and Sweden, quintessentially uh, peace-loving countries that have been neutral for decades. And uh, the fact that these two paladins for peace have joined NATO tells you all you need to know about NATO and all you need to know about Putin. We need to show the Global South that we are the partners they need, that uh, we NATO countries uh, are the partners they need, and that we're there to help them as they make the transition to a green future, that they should beware the trap, by the way, of running up huge debts to other countries uh, that do not share our values and, and maybe do not have their best interests at heart. And the final myth we need to debunk is that when it comes to a crisis like this, Western democracy, because of the pressures that politicians face, do not have the same staying power. And uh, I think that if Ukraine were to be crushed or forced into a, a bad peace, the consequences for freedom around the world would be appalling. And that view is shared by everyone in NATO. So let's be absolutely clear. The best way for us to win the argument around the world about our values, what we stand for, uh, about our opposition to the use of force to change boundaries, about the, the primacy of, of international law. The best way to win that argument is for the Ukrainians to win and for Putin to fail in Ukraine. And that's why I'm pleased today that we've announced another billion pounds worth of military support. And if you wanted evidence of the amazing ability of the Ukrainians to fight back, to overcome adversity, and to repel the Russians, then look at what has happened uh, just uh, today on Snake Island, where again, uh, Russia has had to cede ground. In the end, it will prove impossible for Putin to hold down a country that will not accept his rule. This has been a crucial summit in that we are resolved not just to support Ukraine, but we've agreed a new strategic concept. We're, we're, we're moving uh, additionally beyond the doctrine of tripwire deterrence uh, uh, on NATO's eastern flank to a new approach of defence deterrence by denial. And countries around the table are also recognising that they need to spend more. 
And in our case, that means meeting and being prepared to exceed the target we set for ourselves a decade uh, ago of everybody spending 2% of GDP on defence, uh, the goals that were then set for a very different era. And what we're saying is that we want yes, uh, Stoltenberg, the Secretary General, uh, to start work on that new target now, and, and he's uh, agreed to do that. We need to invest for the long term in vital capabilities like future combat air while simultaneously adapting to a more dangerous and more competitive world. And the logical conclusion of the investments on which uh, we propose to embark uh, of these decisions is that we'll reach 2.5% of GDP on defence by the end of the decade. I want to say uh, a big thank you to our, to our Spanish friends. I think they've done an amazing job. I want to thank uh, yes, Stoltenberg. And my view is at the end of this Madrid summit, the, the NATO alliance is plainly in robust health and getting stronger, with new members and a renewed purpose. We can see that our work is cut out, and we can see that there are billions of people around the world, swing voters, who need to hear and to understand our arguments. But we have a huge advantage of knowing what we want, in believing in our ideas, and having the means to do what we want to do. And above all, uh, we are united. And if history is any guide, then I believe that this great alliance will again be successful. Thank you all very much. And I'd like to go to the media where we, I think we've got a question first from Chris Mason of the BBC. The Prime Minister speaking, though, uh, at the end of the NATO conference in Madrid. Sound quality was terrible, but that was the feed that every broadcaster was getting uh, from Madrid. But apologies for that. Now, it is time for my next Life and Times, my new series of interviews with the biggest political figures of our generation. I talked with Michael Portillo here is Michael Portillo's Life and Times. Michael Portillo, your 1997 defeat became a symbol of the Tories' downfall in 1997. What was it like to be Michael Portillo in that election count? Hmm. Well, maybe not as bad as you might think. Uh, I was in some ways um, quite relieved to lose. You may think that odd, but what I really cared about was being in government. And I had no doubt whatsoever that the Tories were going to go out of government that night. Had I won my seat, I would have had to contest the leadership of the Conservative Party, which I was not keen to do because we had been reduced to a rump. And I knew the Tories wouldn't be back for 10 to 15 years, as indeed turned out to be the case. So there was um, a certain relief to not winning and a certain amount of graveyard humour. By the way, I was pretty prepared for it. An opinion poll in the seat the Sunday before led me to believe that I might lose it. And I was astonished that just before going to my count, I'd been on Newsnight with Jeremy Paxman. And I couldn't believe that he didn't ask me, have you lost your seat? Because it was the first thing that occurred to me. So when I got to the count, I knew I'd lost. I also saw uh, a very disagreeable spat between uh, Jimmy Goldsmith and... Um, David Meller. David Meller. I had the name a minute ago. <laughs> and I thought, whatever I do, it's not going to be like that. There's not going to be any unpleasantness. You know, I must find the magnanimity in the moment. I think I was, um, I think in a way the shock came afterwards. Uh, you have to get used to doing things like getting on buses and going on tubes. And you have this sensation that everybody's looking at you in the sandwich queue, um, either feeling contemptuous about you or feeling sorry about you. So that was more difficult to deal with. I am not sure that I had realised the extent to which I'd become symbolic of the unpopularity of the Conservative Party. But it was brought home to me. And people like you bringing it up 25 years later just helps to remind me. Did it hurt when people used to say, were you up for Portillo? I think there was a book called, Were You Still Up for Portillo? Um, about that, the 1997 election. Did it hurt you in any way that people... <sighs> We're, we're gleeful, people on the left, obviously, or people who would, did not support the Tory party. Was there hurt involved? 
There might have been some. I don't. I don't remember. Don't remember much enduring hurt. Certainly no enduring hurt. Um, you know, the first thing you have to do is find something else to do with your life, and that's all worked out. You know, pretty well. And we might come to that uh, later. But you know, I, I'm sorry uh, that I managed to make myself so unpopular because apart from anything else, that doesn't make you a very successful politician. You know, politics is about winning uh, elections. So. I, th I think it, it possibly helped to remove any illusions I might have about wanting to be the leader of the Conservative Party. And although I contested it in 2001, I must say I did so pretty half-heartedly. Or rather, I only wanted to do it if I won with a decisive majority. And when it was clear that I wasn't going to do that, that if anything I'd win by a vote or two, then I lost uh, interest in doing that. So you can correct me if I'm wrong about these perceptions. I would say that today you're a national treasure. Um, got a really successful uh, TV uh, career. And frankly, if people wouldn't want you to present TV and radio programmes if they didn't think you were popular. But this is my recollection from being a 20-year-old Labour activist, that you were a political bogeyman. Is that, is that a fair... Assessment. I mean, how do, how do you get to become a political bogeyman? How does one become a political bogeyman? Ah, well, part of it, I think, is that you build a pigeonhole for yourself. Because to get noticed in British politics, uh, it's useful that people understand certain things about you. But the problem is, if you, if you build a pigeonhole, let's say, marked right wing, then any information that uh, endorses that point of view goes into the pigeonhole. And any information that is contrary to that perception just gets discarded. So people become very one-dimensional as far as the media and press are concerned. I mean, for example, I think if you go back and ask civil servants or the military, because I was Secretary of State for Defence, what sort of a person I was when I was in office, they would have a different view from what was the general perception. Or if you ask my friends, really, if I've ever been any different at any time in my life, I would say probably I haven't. You say that I'm a national treasurer. I'm actually merely on the ladder to being a national treasurer. There's some distance to go yet. Uh, I'm not an Ed Balls figure at this stage, but working towards it. Um, and yet, I still do political stuff. And when I do political stuff, I don't pull my punches. You know, I, if people ask me what I think about the European Union, I'll tell them. Uh, and so that, that's quite interesting to me, that people now seem more willing to see me in segments so the, the person who takes them around for a jolly ride on the train and tells them about history is somehow allowed at different times, on different channels, at different times of the day, still to have political opinions, which are, which are pretty um, forthright, actually. You, you made a comparison with Ed Balls. I think he might have become a national treasure due to Strictly Come Dancing. Absolutely. Would you, would you do it? No, I would not do it. No. No. no, Ed, I mean, Ed did it very well. I mean, Ed, Ed has amazing talents outside uh, politics, but he's also done a terrific cooking thing, hasn't he? And yeah. I think he won. You know, all credit to him for doing that. And this other perception or perhaps misconception is that I sort of think of you now as sort of like, um, oh gosh, it's not the right script, but like a Hampstead liberal. Like, I don't know, like... Um, Almost metropolitan elite, but not in a, not in a mean way. But when you were a politician, you were described as you know arch right winger, uh, Thatcherite. You're a skeptic. Which perception was wrong, or have you changed? Well, I'm certainly metropolitan. My entire life has been in London. I'm certainly elite. I mean, I went to a grammar school, so I'm not elite in the way that some people are. But as soon as you've you know, been in politics for a number of years and you've been in the cabinet and now you have TV shows, you can't be anything other than sort of elite. And, and it, you know, it's quite difficult to stay in touch with perceptions. I'm liberal in the old fashioned sense that I believe in things like free speech and allowing people to live their lives you know, as they wish. But I'm probably not liberal in the sense that the left might mean that word today. And I'm certainly not a metropolitan elitist liberal if you put all those three words together. And by the way, <clears throat> none of those things is new. I mean, I've always been all of the things that I am today. You, did you vote to leave the European Union? If, uh, if you did. I did, with enthusiasm. Um, and, and shall I say something to you about please. that? Because, for example, I, I, I am the holder of a Spanish passport as well as a British passport. I know Spain pretty intimately. And that, indeed, is one of the reasons why I'm a profound Eurosceptic, 
because it struck me that the countries of Europe are so different. They have such different political cultures. The meaning of citizen, the meaning of state are different in each of these places. Uh, and so I couldn't at all understand the aspiration to want to govern Europeans in general. And I couldn't at all see how you could achieve a government of Europeans in general that would be accountable and democratic. And these are my objections. And the fears that I had, I thought I saw played out in the way that the European Union was moving, always relentlessly moving towards ever closer European Union. And the way, for example, that the Greeks were treated over the Euro, I thought was absolutely appalling and showed the illiberalism of the institution and the lack of accountability and the terrible consequences that could be paid by ordinary people in terms of their loss of uh, income and loss of uh, lifestyle and so on, with an ideology being responsible and a bureaucracy being responsible that was not accountable. So, you know, that is the source of my Euroscepticism. Let's talk, you say you've still got robust views, you just demonstrated some of your robust views on, on, on politics. Um, let's look at today's Conservative Party. People, it's lazy to look for historical parallels. But do you, you, you will have witnessed well, Margaret Thatcher um, in, in, in peril, obviously, well, well, she, she, she resigned. Um, John Major had a really difficult time. Ian Duncan Smith, you've analysed how, what it's like to be in a perilous political position. Do you see any parallels between what's happening in today's Conservative Party? Well, I mean, of course I do. I mean, in the sense that the Conservative Party very often changes its leader uh, and uh, very often does so even in office. I mean, how often uh, have we seen that? I'm not going to take a position of saying that the Prime Minister should go. And I've been rather surprised to hear people who are leaders of the Conservative Party saying that. And I'll tell you a reason why I think that's quite important. Boris Johnson has many attributes and qualities and many, many flaws. But he has won four elections. Two to become mayor of London. London is virtually a socialist city, so this was an extraordinary achievement. Then he headed up the referendum campaign, which won, and then he won a majority of 80 seats. And I see people telling him that he should resign, that the Conservatives should get someone else. And these are people who, to my knowledge and memory, haven't won anything. I mean, they may have held on to safe seats, having been selected, but you know, they've never won a national election. Uh, in the case of one of them, they didn't even win the leadership of the Conservative Party because nobody else stood. Nobody else wanted the job. So I certainly don't think it's my job to say the Conservative Party should find another leader. And I do think, you know, it's interesting, but I, and I do remember this film, and I do think it's interesting that lots of Conservative MPs seem to think they should change leader without having a clue who would take over and why that would be any better. And I do recall uh, speaking to, I think it was Alan Clark when the question of Margaret Thatcher's leadership came up. I think it was then, or it may have been John Major's. But anyway, I remember this expression. He said, let's just throw a grenade into the pond. In other words, he just wanted to blow the whole thing up and see what emerged from the situation. Well, politics. But I think there are quite a lot of people in the Conservative Party today, and it happens again and again, who just want to throw a grenade in the pond. They have no idea whether having got rid of Boris, things will be better or uh, not. Uh, and why does this happen? Uh, one of the reasons is because the, the party consists now largely of people who are disappointed or unappointed or de-appointed. In other words, they didn't get into office uh, or they've been thrown out of office. And this becomes a very large group of people. And what they think is, whoever is the prime minister after Boris Johnson, I have a better chance of being a junior minister and having a ministerial car and a red box under someone else. And that becomes a very powerful engine. So uh, last week, uh, former Conservative Party leader, um, Michael Howard, he would have, you were peers, um, he said he, he should go. You're being quite careful not to, not to say that. Do you think that's right for people who have, are no longer elected politicians? Should they, should they stay out of it? It, it's not even particularly that. I mean, if it were Margaret Thatcher, she's no, no longer with us. But if it were someone who'd won three general elections, saying, I think this person should go because they're not good enough, I could just about understand it. But people who've won nothing, 
<laughs> telling someone who's won four general elections that he should go, I find that very difficult to, uh, to deal with. Are you sad that you never became Prime Minister? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, 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 I, I was spared that. Because you really wanted it. You, you were on a trajectory. No. Ah, that's a different thing. I don't think I did really want it. It's true that I was that's on a trajectory. That's it's true that I was on a trajectory. And I don't know whether the trajectory was of my making or of other people's. In other words, I don't know whether I was actually playing out other people's expectations. Uh, there was a moment um, when, um, when John Major re-stood for the leadership of the Conservative Party when it might have fallen out that I might have become leader. And I could imagine myself doing the job of Prime Minister. I think I'm quite decisive and I'm quite organised, things which actually Boris is not. So in a way, I could imagine that part of the job of Prime Minister as being, to me, quite easy. But the bit that is not easy for me, clearly, is winning elections. I, mean, I lost a safe seat. So I wouldn't be comfortable with that part of it. And I don't think I had the temperament. You're reminding me with this interview just how nerve-wracking it is to do an interview. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I wasn't much liked in the old days and why I'm supposedly a national treasure now is that when you're doing an interview with a Jeremy Paxman or a Gloria de Piero or whoever it may be, it's quite hard to look relaxed and jolly. But when you are presenting a railway journey, a travel programme, or a programme about some other part of history, of course you can be as relaxed and as charming as you wish. And by the way, you can have 10 takes as well. <laughs> you, you're coming across as utterly charming. Um, and I, and I, I think you might be the first uh, person to ever put me and Jeremy Paxman as interviewers in the same sentence, but <laughs> it's certainly not what I strive to be. Your reflections are absolutely fascinating. Just one more light, lighthearted question to finish with. Um, are you and Diane Abbott mates? Because you were, you were put on this television programme together. You were great fun. You on the, you know, an arch right winger, her an arch left winger. And you seem to, to, to get on on TV. Did, did you get on off, off camera too? Yes, we did. Um, it was rather odd because we knew each other at school reasonably well. At school? At school, yes. Oh. We knew, she was at Harrow County School for Girls. I was at Harrow County School for Boys. And we used to do drama together. And in fact, I cast her as Lady Macduff in a film version of Macbeth, which never got made. However, when years later, I remembered Diane as being very shy and self-effacing. And when years later, a rather self-confident woman got elected to Parliament, who also had the name Diane Abbott, I couldn't quite believe it was the same person. In fact, for a while, I didn't believe it was the same person. Now, the producers of this week didn't know that we'd been at school together, yet they threw us together. And we were meant to do it just for the 12 weeks, and then we would be moved on. Um, and then that didn't happen. We did it, I don't know, for the best part of 10 years together. And yes, we got on well on the set. And very occasionally, I remember we went to um, Edinburgh to do a couple of shows around the time of the referendum and so on. And we just went out to dinner, the two of us, and you know, had a perfectly nice time. But we haven't particularly stayed in touch. But there was a chemistry there. I think there was a chemistry. And uh, I think that was because we'd been at school. For some reason, you know, that leaves some vestige in the, in the, in the bloodstream so that we did get on. Um, and, you know, if anyone said, do you want to do a television programme with Diane Average in the future? I would, of course, say yes. Uh, and there was something about the formula of that show which nobody else has replicated, which I'm slightly surprised about. Well, I'd love to present a TV show with you. This has been an utter um, pleasure. Michael Portillo, thank you. Gloria, thank you for being so charming. That was Michael Portillo speaking to me earlier this week. Well, we're told now that the audio is fixed on the Prime Minister's news conference, so we're going to return to that. In the world. Do you see a real chance uh, for Ukraine to win, uh, considering uh, that uh, NATO allies are not so uh, happy to provide us n uh, so needed uh, weaponry? Because we see no uh, modern tanks, no uh, uh, jets, and so on. Uh, maybe you see some ways to do that in that time frame. 
And also, even more important, uh, as you said <laughs> just now, that uh, no one did expect to see uh, Ukraine in NATO, uh, which is sad to hear about. Uh, now, is there a chance? I'm just being realistic there. Yeah, but, but is there you. a chance to uh, to become uh, a, a member of NATO one day after Ukraine wins, or or NATO is still that much afraid of Russia that cannot even uh, think of it? Okay. Because there is no other. Yeah, no, so, well, that, thank thank you. you. I mean, that's that's really good. Uh, so the the reason I went to thank you very much, Sergei. So the reason I went to to Ukraine shortly. Uh, before the, the, all these summits began, it was really I wanted to get a real feel for, uh, for where uh, President Zelensky and his administration were and how they saw things going. And it, it really is clear, as you, as you, as you say uh, just now, they do see a way in which they can change the dynamic this year, in the next few months. And I think that's important, and I think it means we have to, to help them as much as we can because they've shown that they can resist. They can show their amazing, amazing ability uh, to fight back. And that's why I think the most interesting th recent development has been the MLRS, uh, the multi-launch uh, rocket systems, which have been going to, to Ukraine. And I'm told that Ukrainian troops are proving very adept in, in using them. Uh, now, uh, we've, we've got to make sure that uh, that's right and that uh, the Ukrainian troops heroic as they are, are getting the maximum value out of the, the stuff that we're, uh, that we're able to, to send. Uh, but uh, we think that they do indeed have it in their power uh, to, to repel the Russians and, uh, and, and to get them uh, back to the, the pre-February the 24th uh, position. And, and that is, that's certainly what, uh, what Volodymyr says he wants to do, and he set out a plan uh, for, for doing that. Now, uh, as for, the, as for the, the ultimate solution for, the, for Ukraine's presence in the security, security architecture of, of Europe, it's clear to me what should then happen. It's clear to me uh, that leaving aside uh, the question of an Article 5 guarantee, uh, what you have, or what you should have, is the, uh, the Western powers, uh, whether all of NATO or just some NATO countries, uh, should be offering deterrence by denial so that we uh, so fortify a Ukraine with NATO-grade weaponry plus intelligence plus training that no future attack is conceivable. That's, that's stage one, and that's, that's, the, that's the position that we want to, uh, to get to. And I think that that will prove to be uh, a very, very effective solution. There can then be a further argument down the track about uh, about NATO, but it, that would be my my interim uh, my interim solution. Okay, everybody, I've, I was asked, I've, I've, I was told to be no more than nine. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us.